Okay, well, looks like it's moving straight up, so we will go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming to the lunchtime talks in science and mathematics. Um, in two weeks from yesterday, I guess, we have a, a special Halloween edition. It's the Molecules of Witchcraft, so I encourage you to come back for that one. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Duran from our program, our biology program here, talking about plants in space. Okay, so uh, when we got uh, the this, this STEM grant, uh, we, we really focused a lot with you know, the planetarium and, and kind of have a space theme. So uh, we tried to do some talks geared to um, space. And I thought, well, being the plant biologist, it'd be pretty fitting to talk about plants in space. And I don't know what kinds of images these might um, conjure when you think of plants in space. I know uh, one a friend of mine said that the first thing he thought of was pigs in space. You guys remember that movie? Um, but uh, before you get too excited, I thought I'd talk about some of the things I'm not going to talk about. Um, things like plants from other planets or uh, fictional plants and, and other planets, things that are bioluminous or, or bind, uh, join with you or, or move quite a bit and attack you. Um, or other theories, wild theories that are out there. <coughs> there are some people who believe that there are as many as nine species of plants that have been delivered to the Earth from outer space. And so one of them is the Venus flytrap that is actually was jettisoned here on a crater or, or something like that uh, and, and now grows here on Earth. But that really has no credibility. We won't be talking about that either. OK, so what we are going to talk about um, this is just kind of an outline. I'm going to divide the talk into three major parts. First, we're going to talk a little bit about why um, we should grow plants in space. Uh, what are some of the challenges to growing plants in space? And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the experiments and basically what we've learned <coughs> up to date about you know, from growing plants in space and some of the experiments that NASA has done. OK, so one of probably the more obvious is, well, if we grow plants um, in space, uh, we can have food to eat. Um, well, what do astronauts do now? Well, they take everything, um, well, they're starting to learn, to, we're starting to grow plants in space. Uh, and, and since really very early on, in the 1960s, some of the really very earliest things were, were trying to grow plants in space. Started with very lower plants, um, like algae, and then became to these higher plants, these angiosperms, um, plants that are going to be more um, crop plants. Okay, so on to what it is that, that, that astronauts eat. Uh, well, they eat a lot of freeze-dried stuff. Right? And really, in very early expeditions, it was basically freeze-dried, what almost, you know, almost not quite pizza, but things that kept um, crackers and, and, and such. But they learned early on that things like that weren't so good because of crumbs. Um, you know, if you're eating a cracker in space, and you know, crackers, you get a little bit of crumbs, those just float off, right, <coughs> in space. And that can cause problems for some of the instrumentation and whatnot. Um, so what they do now is basically have prepared food that's mixed with this, with like gelatin, and put it in these freeze-dried things. And so they're basically eating this kind of gelatin. So you, you just make sure you don't have any crumbs floating around in space. And so you might imagine after about a week of this, maybe even just a couple of days like this, fresh food would be really good. Um, any fresh food, I mean, even things that might be less desirable, like uh, your Brussels sprouts and broccoli, um, but fresh food would be, would be good to have. Um, fresh food, as we know, really um, is the best source of nutrients. Um, uh, they have antioxidants, which are really pretty good for the immune system. And so these are things that would be good um, for longer duration uh, space missions, which we'll talk about in a second. Plants are also a really good source of, fresh, of, of oxygen, so fresh air. Um, <coughs> and it's also a, a means in which we can recycle water, recycle a lot of the gray water things that astronauts use from um, washing, um, cleaning up, and, and other such things to purify it into more drinkable water. And so these are three things taken together uh, play an important role in um, long duration missions. So. Um, I found this quote that I thought was, was a really good one. Think, imagine if you're going on a, on a long trip, 
Uh, if you're going on vacation for a year and you have to pack all the meals you planned on eating, uh, your car would be completely filled with groceries. And you can imagine in space um, vehicles and space stations, there's not a lot of room to be packing that much food. Um, and so it'd be more uh, feasible to have um, food grown and kind of this really very man-made environment and you have nice, something nice and green to look at and something nice and green to eat, have your fresh salad. Okay. And then one of the main things people have focused on, uh, NASA has focused on, as far as using plants in space, not so much as food, but, but, but really early on as a whole, not just food, but as a whole bioregenerative life support system. And that is where the plants uh, are not only uh, going to provide food, uh, they'll provide that recycled water, uh, and they'll provide fresh oxygen um, for the astronauts, um, who will in turn, uh, they have the, we give off carbon dioxide during respiration, and so that carbon dioxide can be then used by the plants to recycle, basically scrubbing uh, the atmosphere, so uh, making the air um, breathable. Uh, the gray water generated by humans can be then used for the plants to, as a recycled. Of course, then there's going to be some material that is inedible from the plants, um, which will go into this um, microbial bioreactor, as well as things like the urine and the feces, um, that will take all of that and <coughs> recycle it into nutrients then that can go to the plants. And so this whole nice self-contained system for um, support and uh, life support in space. And so there have been some work on this, as I mentioned, from really very early on. They started with just looking at um, algae, looking at mosses, really small things since the 60s. But uh, since like the 70s and, and currently, it's really looking at, at crop um, plants. This is one um, uh, in the Kennedy Space Center using potatoes. And what they found, if you um, have potatoes packed in, uh, it takes about 25 square meters of potato crop doing optimal photosynthesis um, to support um, one person. Okay. And so that's, that's quite a bit. But if you think about it, for just being in space stations, it's probably not a good idea. But for things like maybe colonizing or, or, or missions to like Mars, which was one of the big things that, that NASA was pushing for for a while there, this, this would be the kind of thing that you'd need. We can also translate this into not just um, space, but other extreme environments. And so places like deserts, you know, we've got some, a lot of the Earth's mass. Um, is covered with in, um, inhabitable deserts. And so one thing that you, we can use, translate that into using this bioregenerative uh, life support system into um, colonizing really extreme places like deserts. OK, so those are some, some reasons why we might want to grow um, plants in space. But there are some challenges. And so let's think about that in terms of what plants need. <coughs> While well, plants need light, they need nutrients, uh, they need water, and they need carbon dioxide. And uh, they need to do all of this. They need all of these things to do photosynthesis. Um, photosynthesis is the main things that plants do. Uh, and of course, it's probably the, one of the most important things for us um, and for all animals. It's the process by which plants uh, take light energy, so energy from the sun, as well as carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water, um, and they in turn produce oxygen, which is important to us, it's what we breathe, um, and then uh, sugars, glucose, our, our energy, uh, things that we are going to eat, our food. And so if it weren't for plants making this light energy conversion, really there wouldn't be any um, food for animals to eat, food for us to eat, whether or not we're vegetarians. Uh, we need this process. OK, so let's go through these things. Well, light, um, literally, in space, 
we're going to be you know, far away from the sun, but we've got artificial light means. And so these light, um, light has become more and more efficient. We've got things like LEDs that can last for a really very long time. What we've learned also is that you can use different wavelengths of light, different intensities of light that will increase uh, plant production. Um, and so here are some, so light check, we can, we can deal with that. So where do plants get nutrients? Well, plants get nutrients from the soil. Uh, but you think about growing plants um, in soil in space, well, one, we'd have to take a lot of soil. Um, there are also some problems with soil in um, microgravity. One is when you, when you have soil with kind of coarse particles, um, the, the, the water doesn't distribute very, very equally. Um, if you have soil that's too fine, kind of clay particles, then the water doesn't distribute, you don't get as much air, and so the, the roots need oxygen, and so you're going to go um, hypoxia. So there are some problems. They've been playing around with some different types of materials, but it seems like the best way to go is with hydroponics. And so hydroponics is just taking uh, the nutrients, putting them directly in the water, and then growing the plants without soil, and growing them in water. So pretty easy, right? So all we need to do is um, water the, 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 the plants, have the astronauts out there envision them with this little, the little canisters. Um, okay, but that's not going to work either. Why is that? <laughs> You're going to try to water that? Yeah. <laughs> so so water just, without ga gravity, water's not going to go down. Water's just going to float. And so here's some, some um, interesting pictures of some water poly molecules uh, or droplets. Now this one the size of this guy's head. Okay. <coughs> okay, so the thing to do would, ha would have to be to directly administer the, the water to the roots. And so they've been playing with lots of different versions of lots of different um, growth chambers. And so here's a figure, um, does this work? Yeah, of kind of administering them by syringe. And so we've got these really very small uh, plants, the roots in the bottom, where you're going to be um, administering the water directly by syringe there. And here you can see without soil, again, you just have the roots growing at the bottom there. Okay. Uh, there's lots of different uh, versions. I, I like this one. Uh, this is this Ferris wheel version where you've got the plants um, growing around here. You've got the LED light in the middle. Uh, you've got the <coughs> reservoir of water and the water pump. It's going to bathe it. You're going to move these around. Um, this was one I think that was developed in the 80s. Um, and, and they've sort of abandoned this model for now, although I've seen some other um, architectural designs that do a bigger, a bigger version of making these kind of in the hallways of the crafts, so like space stations. Um, what it also does is help save with space. You know, you can, you can really pack in kind of a lot of plants. You can utilize um, your space. Um, but this one was, I think, sold as a, as a gimmick. Uh, you can have one, buy one of these in, in your house. Mm -hmm. um, another way to think about uh, watering plants or in space is... Um, because one of the problems with just bathing roots in water is you get something called um, hypoxia, uh, which is they don't, they don't get enough oxygen. Roots need oxygen. Uh, we can take a, a, a cue from some plants in nature called epiphytes that basically just grow in, in air. Um, so epiphytes are often growing on other plants. Um, it's not that they're parasites. They just use them for structural support. <coughs> this is a, a picture of an orchid growing on this tree, and here's its roots. And so uh, they're growing without soil, they're not bathed in water. Instead, what they do is they rely on humidity, um, they get uh, water from the atmosphere, as well as nutrients from the atmosphere. And so this whole idea has kind of stemmed a new field um, called aeroponics, um, which is growing plants in basically air, providing these Misters. So here's this nutrient pump. So it's this water filled with nutrients that basically mist um, the roots every so often, keep uh, a really high level of, of um, humidity around those roots. And so here is a picture. It's not a really very good picture of the, the root system, 
here's a plant growing in here uh, within this chamber that's going to have these, this pressurized water just spurred at it um, every so often. Um, aeroponics is something that has really um, taken off. Uh, <laughs> what was kind of interesting, if you, if you Googled um, aeroponics, you end up going to, uh, there were a lot of sites for um, growing uh, cannabis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a big thing in, in, the, in that kind of cultivation. Uh, but this particular figure, uh, uh, this, this photo was taken from um, a garden in Frederick, uh, Colorado, I think it's Frederick. Um, they actually are growing, they have a, a big aeroponics uh, uh, farm. And there's a couple of things that, that you can do. You can grow the plants without soil. For one, makes it really easy to wash. You almost don't even have to wash them. Um, you don't have to, you can grow them in these large greenhouses and you don't often need um, pesticides. It also decreases the amount of water that these plants require by 60%. So quite a bit. Um, these, they, they, they talked to, a, so I saw this, this news um, program about it. They talked to a um, woman who owned a restaurant in Larimer Square and she gets a lot of her produce from one of these farms. And what's nice about them is you can, they're, they're completely fresh. Uh, you cut them off, you can see them harvesting here. And then um, you, they, they deliver to the restaurant and the same day, basically. The day that they're harvested, they can be served um, on your plate. Uh, they, they believe that in the future, uh, maybe not too distant future, that they might, a lot of restaurants might just have some of these, these things growing um, in, in the back there, and they'll just, whenever they need spices, they'll just go out and snip them. And so a, a really neat idea. Okay, and so regardless of how um, you might do it, uh, there's, there's water, we, we can either do hydroponics, um, aeroponics seems to be uh, the best way. I like this setup here. Uh, it's just a really very basic setup of this is also aer aeroponics. You've got a zucchini growing out of this plastic bag with just enough water to keep a really high level of humidity in there so that it, it can grow. Okay. <clears throat> and so then plants need carbon dioxide. Okay, we, we've got a lot of astronauts doing their fun tricks, uh, expelling uh, carbon dioxide, and so there's, you know, they can get that, the, the, the carbon dioxide that way. The only problem is to make sure that the air is, is circulated. That's another problem within microgravity is having trouble uh, making sure that the air is, is circulated because if it's not around the leaves you get something called photorespiration which means that the plant is producing oxygen but if it's not um, really being circulated away from the leaf and carbon dioxide coming in it'll start to fix that um, oxygen instead and um, it's not good for the leaf, it did, nothing really comes out of it, and, and that could be a problem for the leaves. And so making sure that there's a, a, adequate air circulation is important. Okay, so this is, these are the things that plants need in order to make food, is which is what, what we want them to do, right? Uh, but what else would we like them to do, um, especially in space, um, is to reproduce. So we'd like for them to be able to make seeds, so then we can plant those seeds and, and we can propagate um, these plants in, in kind of a long-term um, environment. And so I'll talk a little bit about this later in our um, experiments, that, that we really have been able to get plants to grow, uh, to produce seed in space, and also uh, those seeds are viable. Okay, so a couple of other factors um, to <coughs> consider um, is temperature. Uh, um, Plants don't do well in too extreme temperatures, but fortunately neither do we. So if we can do our, our um, temperature regulation for us, then that would be just fine um, for the plants. Uh, when I talk about space, I don't mean plants out in space. Plants need space to grow, right? If, as we talked about um, with the potatoes, if we need 25 square meters of potatoes, we need you know, places to, to do that. So, so what do we do? Um, one of them is to create these cultivars of dwarf crops. Uh, and so this has been going on um, for several years. Several different universities um, have been cultivating um, crops that are uh, much smaller in size. And so here is one called um, Apogee Wheat. It was developed uh, one of the universities in Utah. I don't remember which one right now. Oops. 
Uh, ASU, yes, it's right there. <laughs> Utah State University. <laughs> uh, so you've got your dwarf um, um, uh, wheat. And so here's a, a guy with his um, dwarf wheat up there. And they've done this with lots of other different, different plants. And so uh, one way is to decrease the size and also to increase um, the ratio to the kind of the edible to the non-edible. So we want, we want more of the edible stuff um, than things like, uh, you know, these long stalks. We really are concerned mostly with things like the seed. Okay, so space, um, check. Uh, and then the last thing um, is gravity. Uh, plants seem to, uh, they've, they've evolved in gravity, so what happens when you, you um, take away gravity? Uh, microgravity affects a few things that are important for plants. Uh, first of all, as I already mentioned, um, how water diffuses through the soil is affected by microgravity, how air moves around the plant, um, <clears throat> and then subsequently how oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged. Um, for the most part, it seems like we've, we've dealt with most of these, um, and plants can grow um, uh, pretty effectively in space. Uh, but some of the things that, that we have in addition to uh, the impaired gas exchange, you have reduced mechanical stimuli. Right? So plants are used to growing with, with gravity coming down, and that's going to affect their um, hormone production. Um, as well as what happens, what we're, we're doing with the roots. Um, if they have too much water, um, not enough water, that's going to also affect hormonal changes. And so we've got things like um, um, cytokinins, auxins, and ethylene are all plant hormones. And so those, these are things that are going to be um, altered. So all of these things have been focused of a lot of the experiments. Um, so one of the big things, uh, the big experiments, is something called, uh, to look at uh, plants. Um, uh, ability to respond to gravity. And so gravitropism is exactly that, that plants will respond to gravity, plants grow up against, uh, stems grow up against gravity, and roots grow down with gravity. And so I like this was a, a great uh, quote, the best place to study um, gravitropism so we can really learn about gravitropism is where we don't have gravity. So what do plants do? And so as Allison, uh, he, studied um, several uh, Arabidopsis plants. And so what they do is take uh, these petri dishes, um, line them with these, these seeds, put them in these little beds here that are then put in these canisters. And those canisters are taking the space and they're allowed um, to do their thing for a certain period of time before the astronauts come down to space, uh, come back from space down to Earth. They will inject these canisters with something that will stop all growth, uh, preserve the growth, and preserve the genes. That way they can come back and see what gene uh, expression, uh, what was either upregulated or downregulated, what happened um, with the roots. OK, <clears throat> so finally, um, what are some of the experiments uh, that have been done in space, and what have we learned um, from some of those experiments? So one of them has to do with a theory of how um, gravity, gravitropism works. And so one of them is called this Statolith theory. And in this theory, it's that plants have got these little plastids um, in their roots uh, that contain starch granules. And wherever the, the starch granules press down on, that that is where gravity is, so that plants know uh, how to redistribute their hormones and have uh, roots grow in the appropriate uh, direction. This has been interesting because it's been a pretty controversial theory for a long time because there hasn't been a really good adequate way of studying it. Uh, they've tried to knock out uh, so that you don't have any of these statoliths and you get some gravity perception and, and there's lots of different things. Um, but, th but they found that this seems to be valid. Um, they looked in, in grown in, in microgravity. Um, plants that have higher levels of starch tend to have a little more response to even low, low amounts of gravity, um, whereas those without starch or very little starch don't really have a good response, uh, gravitropism response. Um, so, so this is one of the things that we've learned. Mm, here's a picture of a, a root cell. <coughs> And this is the cap. And so within these cells, these are these little um, starch, um, kind of they act as like statoliths that let, let the, the plant know which way is down, which way gravity 
goes. And so it seems like uh, the, this is a pretty valid theory. Uh, we've grown lots of different plants in space. Um, and so plant structures uh, seem to form normally in space. Uh, with one little exception, and that's the cell walls. Um, cell walls uh, seem to have reduced thickness. Uh, and it really varies in the different types of plants, which is why it seems to be important to continue doing uh, research with a variety of plants. Um, in um, Arabidopsis, uh, which is kind of like the fruit fly of a, of a plant geneticist, um, it has a degradation of a, of a couple of compounds, the hemocellulose being one of the main ones here, and xyloglucans. <coughs> Uh, that's so the, the, the reduced wall thickness is due to um, the degradation of these particular chemicals. In rice, um, it's the degradation of uh, hemicellulose and then some other polysaccharides um, in the wall, <coughs> still leading to decreased um, uh, wall thickness. But well, what's interesting that they studied in rice uh, in this particular study is that they found that if you have uh, less wall thickness that increases the cell flexibility. Um, increasing the cell um, flexibility also then increases the elongation, so you get bigger plants. Um, <coughs> when you looked at the when they, they looked they looked at the potato tubers, um, there was no difference um, in their cell walls. Uh, they've also learned that plants can produce viable seeds in space. Um, and so a couple of studies uh, looked at brassica. Uh, they looked at the, they found that there is a reduced rate of maturation. Um, so if you compare seeds or embryogenesis in plants, uh, seeds in space, uh, as well as those in Earth, on Earth, that they are much, the, the time it takes for them to mature is much um, slower in space. And it seemed to be due to a decreased, uh, oops, get these confused, starch and lipid uptake. So as the seed is growing, it takes up starch, uh, starches and lipids from the parent plant, um, and then it deposits it in its seed and it, and, it, and it matures. And so it seems like this is a much slower process uh, there are, I keep pressing the wrong one. Sorry. There's also fewer storage proteins in lipids and tissues um, as, they, as they start to grow. Uh, there's imp impaired lipid utilization in germinating seeds, again, uh, so we have slower root growth. Uh, there are higher soluble carbs but lower seed production. Um, they think that at least these uh, few up here might be due to um, hypoxia, so that the, 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 as the parent plants are, are growing, uh, they're not getting enough um, oxygen um, to their roots, and so they are, um, just have much slower, slower growth. These studies, I believe, were done in, in more um, hydroponics. It'll be interesting to see if that changes when they look at things like um, aeroponics. <clears throat> they also found in this particular uh, plant that when they grew plants, when they grew the plants from seeds, they found that there was a 75% increase in a compound, uh, compounds called glucosinolates, which are defense compounds for this particular plant. Uh, so that, that could mean that it could alter the, the flavor of, this, of these, these plants. Um, and also, if you see, it has uh, different seed protein and such. Uh, there could be some impacts on the nutritional quality of these plants as well as their palatability. Okay. Um, other seeds, so um, Ara Arabidopsis seems to grow from seed to seed with really no, no major differences. Soybeans also uh, have been looked at. There seems to be no effect on germination rates and morphology, except their seeds seem to be bigger. Um, and the plant biomass is bigger is interesting. So when they take these plants that produced seeds in space, these soy plants, and then grew them, they had a 4% higher biomass than control plants. Not, not sure why. Um, also, there seems to be a difference in um, the phytochemical compositions. Um, again, might, might have some impact on flavor. <coughs> <coughs> oh, 
moon. Okay. Uh, we've also learned that, that plants have different gene expression in space. Okay. So uh, cucumbers seem to increase auxin gene expression. Um, auxin is the do everything hormone in plants almost. You know, when, you, when you think about what it does, well, well, it's more easy to ask what doesn't auxin do in plants. And it's one that is implicated in gravitropism, phototropism. So these are uh, responses to gravity, responses to light. Um, and so it makes sense then that this is probably something that would be altered, um, that would maybe be, that would increase because uh, Having more um, auxin will increase the, um, uh, the gene, so kind of it becomes upregulated. If you don't have adequate auxin uh, dispersion, so if the auxin isn't going in the right places, then that's going to affect the gene expression. Also in cucumbers, uh, there's an increase in the alcohol dehydrogenase uh, de gene expression, which that specific one seems to be due to hypoxia. Uh, tend to get that one. They, the article I looked at talked about maybe coupling this with some kind of um, fluorescence so that whenever um, this is expressed, there'll be a fluorescence cue that'll come. So astronauts will know that this plant is becoming hypoxic. Let's do something different. Uh, Arabidopsis seems to have several different genes that are expressed um, and a lot of them are related to um, heat shock uh, proteins or genes involved in heat shock, uh, which would make sense when plants are stressed. Uh, they seem to, to regulate this. Um, but it also seems to, to maybe point to, um, because these plants were not heat stressed, um, it could point to other functions uh, for these genes than, than the ones that we currently know about. Um, and then also, if you took plants uh, in and turned on the lights and looked at the gene expression in, in uh, microgravity compared to if you did the same thing on Earth, you had hundreds of genes that are expressed. And they, they really, that's still ongoing. They really don't know what, what genes specifically they are and what they're involved in. Uh, also, um, some metabolic pathways um, seem to be affected uh, by space. Um, so there seems, in, in some plants, we've had some decreased uh, starch uh, concentration um, overall, uh, lower starch synthetic enzymes being produced, um, altered starch grain properties, so some, some places you'll have uh, increased um, amylose. Uh, ethylene levels um, seem to double in space. Uh, and again, this one, they gave various reasons. One of them, again, might be hypoxic um, conditions. Uh, this one I thought was kind of fun. Um, they thought there's lots of different properties of plants that might be altered in space. And so one of them, uh, scent, might growing a, a rose in space, or in space would, would you have a different smell? And so I found that overall, the, the, the smell of, of, a, of a rose uh, decreased, but the main rose smell um, constituents, which are, I'm not going to say them, but these ones all up here, seem to increase um, in space. <coughs> and so, of course, they then use this. This is this, this ultra-rosy space smell is resynthesized. And so if you've heard of the fragrance Zen, uh, they've marketed this, and so now it's, it's the main uh, Fragrance and Zen is, was inspired by roses that grew in space. Mm -hmm. okay. um, also, then there's, there's um, impacts on agriculture, uh, naturally. Uh, growing crops in challenging environments. Well, there's no other challenging environment than growing in space. And so then we can, we can play that. Uh, we can look at that here on Earth. Um, also, by manipulating the different crops, uh, we've been able to have the highest uh, wheat harvest per acre, uh, which is five times more than the previous record holder, just by looking at some of these crops that have been um, kind of engineered um, for space. And then, of course, high quality crops, meaning that they have a really high nutritional value uh, to their um, biomass ratio. They've also come up with something called bio keys. Um, this is something that 
that has been used in response to, you know, why is it that, that plants are producing so much ethylene or how can we uh, break down um, some of this ethylene. Uh, what you might not know about ethylene, um, it's a gas uh, and it, it's also a plant hormone. And so the plants release this, this gas um, through their leaves and then it affects um, them and it affects nearby, nearby plants. Ethylene is also what causes plants to ripen. Um, and so that's why you might have heard if you want to uh, ripen an avocado, uh, to put it with like a ripe banana uh, in a paper bag and close that up. That's because the banana, a, a ripe fruit, will uh, produce ethylene, and then that ethylene will cause that uh, avocado to ripen. And so uh, one of the things that, that, that NASA has, has made this is, is this BioKeys um, unit that will convert ethylene um, into carbon dioxide uh, using water and, and UV light. So this is something you can use in um, storage units for food so that they don't um, ripen. So as they start to produce this ethylene, break it down so they, they don't ripen. Um, or in like flower display cases, because also ethylene is what's going to help them kind of mature and then die quicker. So you can have this that will take away this um, UV light. So I don't know if that's really an impact on agriculture, but that's, that's an impact um, here on Earth. Uh, and then we can also control and regulate how sturdy a plant will grow. And so we found that, that um, the cell wall seems to be um, thinner. Um, we can kind of engineer these plants using those, those ideas to make plants grow not quite as sturdy. Now, why might, why might we want to do that? Um, for one, uh, paper production might uh, ease uh, paper production. We might be able to get plants that grow um, pretty quickly and we can use them more efficiently and maybe that will um, decrease the rates of deforestation. So those are some, some other ideas there. Okay. Okay, so I, I talked a lot faster than I thought I would, but I wanted to get to, to this. There's this, this, this man, his, name was, uh, his last name is Pettit, I think, who uh, has created this blog. It's called The Diary of a Space Zucchini. And so he, they, they were growing this, this uh, zucchini uh, in space uh, recently. And so it, it basically, it's, I think it's this huge phenomenon. It's got lots of people. I think he might even be on Twitter. I don't know. Uh, but he talks about the, the zucchini in, in, in the terms of, it, of the zucchini. And so I like this. Uh, I sprouted thrust into this world without anyone consulting me. I am not one of the beautiful. I am not one that by, by other, any other name instills flutters in the human heart. I am the kind that makes little boys gag at the dinner table, and thus being sent to bed without dessert. I am utilitarian, hearty vegetable matter that can thrive under harsh conditions. I am zucchini, and I am in space. And um, so it goes on. Uh, there's lots of different ones. Um, it talks about um, <laughs> him sprouting, um, how this is not um, hydroponics. His, his roots are bound in a, in a uh, Ziploc bag. Uh, it's filled with it. So it's, it talks about how he grows um, in, this, in, this little, uh, in this little bag. Uh, and this for zucchini also made flowers. And, uh, and I thought well, what was, was funny is that the plant made it sound like the plant should be making more leaves and not flowers. Um, and so this one I thought was interesting because they, they got really excited if they produce flowers. That means that they can make more zucchinis, right? And so these plants um, have both male plant male flowers and, and female flowers. And, and so in this one, he talks about how he thought it was being fitting, being in a part of an all-male crew, that he only made male flowers. Um, right. And so <coughs> the, the diary of a space zucchini is probably a good illustration of, of some of the psychological impacts of growing plants in space. Um, they found that th they're starting to study this more intensely, uh, that it might actually be good um, to have that activity or to have something that reminds you of, of home while you're in these long uh, duration space, space trips. There was a, a story about a, I think a Ukrainian astronaut who was up on a, a solo uh, flight for, I don't, it wasn't, this might have been a month. And he had, to, one of the things he had to do <coughs> was uh, take these, take care of these plants, because these other plant uh, scientists wanted him to take care of these experiments in space. 
And this first I think, thing was, I don't want to have anything to do with these plants. I'm too busy. Time for plants. Uh, but they said, you know, this is part of your job. You have to do this, you know, for a certain, you know, 20 minutes every day, something like that. Well, as the time goes on, he started spending more and more time with these plants until towards the end, they're like, you know, you, you're spending too much time with the plants. You need to be doing some of these, these other things. And one of the first things he said when he came back is really long-term space travel would not be, is not possible unless you have plants. Um, so it really seems to have a, a psychological impact. And, um, and so this, this good, this diary space, he says that his gardener likes to fuss with his leaves and he sticks his nose against them. Does he take me for some sort of handkerchief? <laughs> Uh, apparently, he takes pleasure in my earthy smell. There's nothing like the smell of living green in this forest of engineered ma uh, machinery. Maybe this is one of my roles as a crew member on this expedition. So, okay. So, without any questions. <laughs>